So to borrow some of the tricks that Dr. Moya had talked about last night, I'm going to start off with some um, slides not actually specific regarding my topic, and this is actually the Vanderbilt Medical School, uh, built in 1925. Our offices are are um, just down the hallway from here, and the furniture is the same from 1925. Hasn't really changed at all. Um, this is a view of, of the campus. Everything in brick is actually the medical center, and uh, everything green around is actually the undergraduate campus and the other grad schools. Uh, and then this is the Vanderbilt Ingram Cancer Center, uh, and have to show uh, the Nashville skyline here. Um, so these are the guidelines that came out uh, actually just this fall. Uh, actually, several members here were involved looking at treatment outlines then for non-metastatic muscle invasive disease. Next slide. So the purpose here was, again, similar to the other guidelines that have been outlined, to look at a framework then for not only urologists, but for medical oncologists and radiation oncologists as well, to include for the treatment outline for those patients that then have non-metastatic disease. And we understand both for men and women, but specifically in looking at curves for, for men in terms of diagnosis and problems with uh, the prevalence of disease, the incidence of bladder cancers actually continues to be quite high for men uh, and is actually the fourth most common cancer amongst men. And if you look at the stats for 2018, really not much has changed in terms of the number of men and women diagnosed with, with bladder cancer. And if you look at the curves for women, the incidence in terms of, of uh, bladder cancer doesn't make the top 10, yet for men continues to be quite high, 7% uh, in terms of urinary bladder there, and estimated deaths within the top 10 again for bladder cancer. Unfortunately, though, if you look at survival curves, really there's been no improvement survival rates in for bladder cancer over the past three decades, whereas other types of cancers have shown a significant improvement. Uh, and so it's an attempt now with the new, actually, uh, treatment options that we have now available that we'll talk about this afternoon that hopefully this survival curve will start changing. So the guidelines. Uh, this is a, a brief run-through in terms of important points and and points that I think I want to highlight. Um, we, we had a discussion actually uh, just this morning regarding the follow-up and surveillance of these patients. Uh, we know that for these patients and with invasive disease, the occurrences tend to happen within the first two to three years. Uh, and as stage progresses, in other words, as your stage becomes higher and worse, the more dangerous your disease is, the more likely you are to have recurrence. In looking at pathologic features that are most important, obviously pathology rules the, the, the uh, actually outcomes in terms of not only recurrence and survival, but other factors come into play as well, including hydronephrosis, lymphovascular invasion, uh, as well as soft tissue margins and molecular subtyping, which we'll again also talk about this afternoon. So this is going to be then a listing of the different types of guidelines, and I've underlined some points, and I've actually bolded some points in red that I think are the most important. Uh, you know, the guidelines need to have an initial evaluation, H&P, and those types of things, but some points that are important. The staging evaluation should have some form of cross-sectional imaging, be it a CT scan or an MRI scan, have some type of baseline serum tests, a CMP and a CBC, uh, and then the importance of throughout the guidelines is a combination of under understanding the importance of not only um, uh, surgical options, but medical options in the combination of radiation therapy as well as a, a, as a standpoint. And then the understanding that the patient is an important part of the decision-making process. So in understanding the importance of chemotherapy, um, level one evidence uh, and a point that was emphasized within the guidelines was the use of neoadjuvant cisplatinum-based chemotherapy. Um, understanding that the cystectomy should occur as soon as possible and hopefully within an eight-week time period following chemotherapy to proceed with that cystectomy with the combination therapy. I think Dr. Kamat made an excellent point this morning regarding that patient. If that patient was found to have instead of T1 disease but actually T2 disease, then the importance and the evidence would suggest that neoadjuvant chemotherapy prior to cystectomy would be most beneficial for that patient in terms of survival outcomes. The points here in red, I think, are also important in terms of right now, there are no validated factors that will tell us at this point uh, yet routinely whether or not certain uh, indicators in terms of neoadjuvant chemotherapy are more or less likely to work. The best regimen and the duration of that therapy is still yet unclear. 
Um, and then understanding that not everybody can get neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Importantly, the emphasis of cisplatinum was, was paramount. In other words, giving bad chemotherapy is worse than giving no chemotherapy at all. Now, how long you give it um, uh, in, in terms of the specific agents, in other words, gemcitabine, cisplatinum versus MVAC versus uh, dose and dense MVAC, we do not advocate any one other than the fact that cisplatinum should be the, the treatment of choice. In terms of cystectomy, it's a combination of not only removal uh, in the males of the bladder and prostate seminal vesicles, and in females, the bladder, uterus, and, and other GYN organs, but the combination of that plus a pelvic lymph node dissection. And importantly, these guidelines, and never done before in terms of treatment options, is understanding and making sure that the patients are counseled in regards to the sexual impact in terms of sexual function and the fact that there are certain organ-preserving procedures that can be done at the time of cystectomy for these patients. Diversion. So in looking at the different types of diversion types, so ileal convert versus orthotopic neobladder versus continent cutaneous diversions, Clearly not one is superior to any other. It's important that the combination of not only quality of life issues, but the importance of what the possible side effects are associated with each of those diversion types should be discussed with the patient. Understanding that each diversion type has its own unique set of complications and possible impact on quality of life. Uh, looking at the wide variety of studies out there in terms of what may or may not be beneficial is really dependent upon that individual patient. And there's no study that says quality of life is better for this type of diversion versus another type of diversion. Uh, importantly, point 14 here, I didn't underline, was the importance at the time of an orthotopic diversion to make sure a urethral margin is in fact negative. Perioperative management. Uh, Dr. Black actually will give a talk on, on pathways and enhanced recovery after surgery in terms of what's best for cystectomy patients. Uh, importantly, these guidelines actually give uh, some evidence in regards to what can be helpful, what's useful, and what should uh, actually physicians consider along with their patients. And that would include uh, the use of these enhanced recovery uh, pathways, the importance of nutritional counseling. We had a whole session yesterday afternoon regarding the benefit of overall optimization of not only nutritional status, but an exercise status as well. Smoking cessation and, and bowel preparation. Actually, uh, we'll have a talk also this morning regarding the possibility of thromboembolic complications and the avoidance of that and the importance at the time of cystectomy to take that into account. There's increasing data that these patients, especially as they get new adjuvant chemotherapy, are even more likely to have thromboembolic complications. And you throw in the possibility of cystectomy along with these patients, it's important to keep that in mind. Data I'm sure that Peter will mention regarding alvimapan in terms of the strength of evidence, this is clearly the one agent or intervention that has the highest quality of evidence in terms of decreasing the length of stay and decreasing uh, any bowel complications associated with those patients undergoing radical cystectomy. Clearly uh, an impact of one to two days in terms of length of stay. Big debate regarding pelvic lymphadenectomy. Um, two large trials have not yet reported uh, the final results regarding the ultimate benefit uh, and or perhaps lack of benefit with an extended lymph node dissection versus a standard lymph node dissection. Uh, at the very minimum, uh, it's outlined that the external and internal iliac as well as the obturator lymph nodes be removed. Uh, the uh, evidence within the guidelines suggests the possible benefit of a, a wider uh, lymph node dissection vis-a-vis -vis the possible side effects associated with that. But at the very minimum, clearly lymph nodes need to be removed. A minimum standard lymph node dissection needs to be done because there's an impact on overall survival. Those patients that don't have a lymph node dissection are less likely to live compared to those that actually do. Patient selection. So importantly, uh, actually there's a patient advocate, Diane Qualley, was actually on the guidelines panel, uh, importantly emphasizing the impact of the fact that patients should have a clear role uh, in choosing the therapy that they have for this particular issue and that bladder preserving therapy, although maybe not ideal for every patient, should at least be discussed for every patient. And clearly it's the combination of a multimodality bladder preserving strategy. So a combination of maximal TURBT, 
chemotherapy as well as radiation therapy and continued follow-up to bladder is the optimal approach if bladder preservation is to be chosen. And that combination of therapy is far superior than any individual modality itself in terms of bladder preservation. Importantly, that patient selection takes into account what the patient actually feels in terms of what may be in his or her best interests. Looking at other possible bladder-preserving therapies, um, a combination of partial cystectomy alone uh, uh, versus a maximal TRBT should not be the primary therapy. In addition, radiation therapy alone should not be offered as curative treatment. And remember, these are actually guidelines supported by ASTRO as well. Clearly, the use of just radiation in and of it by itself should not be used as a curative treatment. Can be used for palliation but in no ways should be as advocated as the treatment of choice for cure. Here's the point regarding multimodality therapy in terms of the chemotherapy agents out there. We talked about cisplatinum-based neoadjuvant chemotherapy is the standard of care and the treatment of choice for neoadjuvant chemotherapy. For those patients then who want bladder preservation therapy and want the best possibility of cures with multimodality therapy, the chemotherapy options would include cisplatinum, or a combination of 5-FU and mitomycin. And importantly, these patients will continue to need to have their bladders surveyed and evaluated, not only through the process of actually getting those treatments, but in follow-up afterwards. And in those patients that afterwards have disease that recurs, there is within our treatment algorithm a decision tree that's important regarding those patients that actually have invasive disease or high-risk disease. They should actually, in fact, undergo cystectomy. And those patients, however, with non-muscle invasive disease or lower-risk disease, then standard therapies actually can apply. Uh, treatment failure, we've talked about surgical treatment, uh, and I just talked about the treatment in terms of conventional means for non-muscle invasive disease. Surveillance and follow-up, um, there is no uh, level one evidence saying that this treatment surveillance protocol is better than any other. But importantly, we tried to take into account that, remember, the disease recurrence and or um, uh, new disease may occur usually within the first few years. And as a result, it's recommended that every 6 to 12 months that a combination of imaging as well as an evaluation of the patient by laboratory assessment be done. And it's a combination not only for evaluation for disease recurrence, but also for the impact that any urinary diversion has on metabolic um, symptoms or derangements that the patients may develop. And so for those reasons, a combination of disease follow-up as well as overall outcomes after the diversion, a combination of not only imaging but serum studies are recommended. And importantly, uh, Dr. Lerner uh, talked about evaluation of the urethra and how it should be done, what should be done. There's no specific outline saying one therapy or evaluation process is better than the other, but it's important that the urethra, not only in continent diversions, but in ileal conduit diversions, as well as continent cutaneous diversions, that the urethra be monitored. Um, importantly, we included different types of, of uh, support groups and counseling that's available to the patients and wanted to make sure that that was available uh, for all those out there. And then there's a whole section regarding the positive impact of not only health, uh, health basically lifestyle choices, but as well including the importance of nutritional uh, choices as well as exercise choices within the guidelines and the importance of actually emphasizing that to the patient. Uh, also within the guidelines, there's the impact of the possibility of the negative effects of malnutrition and actually the sarcopenia that was mentioned yesterday as well. Variant histology, uh, we, we mentioned it briefly in the panel this morning, uh, and actually I think uh, Dr. Kamat may have a talk later on today about variant histologies as well. Um, uh, what we know is we don't know uh, a lot yet about variant histologies. There is a concern that uh, these histologies definitely uh, have a more aggressive nature, um, but regarding the best and optimal therapy for these, we yet do not know. And as a result, for those individual patients, these guidelines regarding the importance of new adjuvant chemotherapy, the importance of combination therapy may not apply. And within the guidelines, there's certain disease characteristics where right now we don't know if new adjuvant chemotherapy is in fact beneficial at all. And in fact, the recommendation is to proceed with radical cystectomy and removal of the bladder. So it's in these patients, we emphasize the importance of recognizing the variant histologies. Unfortunately, yet we don't know yet the optimal therapeutic intervention for these patients. Future research, 
I, I mean, the emphasis on a combination of all the things that we just talked about, and actually a lot will be discussed uh, today as well, uh, markers, evaluation in terms of follow-up for these patients. We all mentioned in the panel that we would get urine cytology. Well, the impact and the beneficial um, impact of cytology after urinary diversion is, is really not known. The changes that can occur after a continent diversion versus a chondro diversion are yet not known. So a better marker for not only follow-up and detection, but for surveillance. The importance of optimizing for the therapies. You saw the survival curves showing no difference whatsoever the past few decades. We hope now with new agents that we have now available that that curve will start to show an improvement and perhaps those interventions can occur sooner as opposed to later. And, and then the importance uh, of surveillance for the non-muscle invasive guidelines, we've talked about actually decreasing surveillance for low-risk patients. You know, that may be the case for these patients as well. With At the time of bladder removal, they may end up being PT0 after neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So should those be patients be monitored any differently? We yet do not know. So a lot yet continues to be looked at in terms of research. So this is a busy slide that shows the actual one-page dictum put out by AUA and ASCO and ASTRO to try to put on one page all the different treats, uh, types of treatment modalities for those patients that have non-metastatic muscle invasive bladder cancer. And as you go through the algorithm, there are uh, actually changes for if patients actually have positive margins or higher risk disease and or recurrence and what to do. And so it's an attempt to basically then um, codify on a page uh, those patients in, in terms of best therapy options. So I want to acknowledge the, the panel. This is a combination, like I said, of, of medical oncologists, radiation oncologists, patient advocacy groups, as well as urologic surgeons. Uh, and I'll, I'll stop right there. Thank you.